Hello, my name is Terry Johnson. I'm a bioengineering lecturer at UC Berkeley. Today we're going to talk about traditional biological risk assessment. So we look to the NIH guidelines for research involving recombinant DNA molecules. And by we, I mean your lab, but also your organization's Office for Guidance and Oversight. At UC Berkeley, this is called Environmental Health and Safety, or EHS, but your organization will have one as well. And much of the conversation is between the two of you. While you should both be aware of the NIH guidelines, uh, the office is there to help guide you in determining how they apply to your research. An example of this dialogue is given here. At UC Berkeley, we call this a biological use authorization. It's basically something that a lab prepares and gives to EHNS that describes the kinds of experiments the lab plans on doing and the kinds of organisms that the lab plans on doing them on. This gives EHNS, the oversight group, the information that they need to best guide the lab in how to work safely and according to the law. Now, how do we enforce the rules that exist? Well, there's punishment. There's the potential that you could lose your permits. There are significant fines. Uh, you can be shut down or for misuse of what we'll call uh, select agents and discuss later, uh, jail time. More typically, what we see are administrative controls. But it's important to realize that these administrative controls change slowly, and synthetic biology is a rapid field. Administrative controls are no substitute for a researcher's active consideration of biosafety and biosecurity. They should act as a guide, but not a replacement for your own good judgment. So what is a biohazardous agent? Well, these are infectious or pathogenic agents capable of causing disease in healthy humans, plants, and animals. And this can include a variety of different kinds of organisms. Assessing risk of those organisms includes factors such as the virulence, pathogenicity, or infectious dose, which makes sense. But you also want to consider the environmental stability. How well is this going to survive and for how long will it survive in a laboratory environment? its route of spread and communicability. How would it spread if released? The quantity, concentration, and volume that are being used in the experiments. And whether there are vaccines or treatments available. It's also important to consider the allergenicity. Based on these things, we come up with a risk group classification. Risk group one are for agents not associated with disease in healthy adult humans. An example of this would be non-pathogenic E. coli. Risk group two are associated with human disease, but rarely serious, readily preventable, or treatable human disease. An example of that would be salmonella. A risk group three agent is associated with serious human disease for which interventions may be available. An example of that would be HIV. Lastly, risk group four uh, agents are likely to cause serious or lethal human disease, and interventions are not usually available. So there's not potentially a treatment or a vaccine. An example of this would be Ebola. Now this is a classification of risk associated with an agent. There are also biosafety levels, which are procedures that are appropriate for dealing with various kind of risk group agents. Biosafety level one involves gloves and mask and, uh, and sort of standard decontamination of waste. Now biosafety two adds risk-specific training, limitations on lab access, SHARPS precautions, and physical containment of experiments when appropriate. For example, if an experiment is likely to cause an aerosol to be formed. Biosafety level three adds on pathogens and lethal agent training, routinely has physical containment of experiments, and has a restricted access specialized lab. An example of this would be this CDC facility. Biosafety level four is much rare. An example is given here of a US Army Medical Research Facility. Uh, there are a small number of these across the world and the training is much more intense along with the sort of limitations on how the facility in the lab can function. So how would you assess risk? Well, going to Appendix B of the NIH recombinant DNA guidelines. Researchers can use this to compare a potential agent, something that they're planning to create in the lab, to existing agents. 
For novel experiments, this requires the active participation of the researcher. It's not as if you're simply going to create your potential agent and run it through a bunch of tests to determine what the risk group is. That would be unsafe. You need to consider what the likely risk group for a potential agent is in your experiment using the Appendix B as a guide to show you how similar organisms have been risk grouped. But it's critical that you actively participate in a consideration of the assessment of risk, especially when you're producing an organism that's never existed before. Select agents we discussed earlier, and they're regulated by these groups. Now these are typically bio, uh, bioterrorism or biowarfare agents. They include specific organisms, but also specific proteins, and in some cases, more abstractly defined things, require extensive permits to work with, and violations have severe penalties. So it's important to know if you're working with or considering working with a select agent, what the rules are. Here's a list of potential uh, select agents. These are, uh, uh, some of these will be familiar to you. For example, anthrax. Also, the reconstructed 1918 flu. Uh, this was recreated so that it could be studied and determine why the 1918 flu was so deadly. An interesting example is botulinum neurotoxin. And why is that interesting? Well, there's one other thing that we do need to consider, and that is dual use. Can your work, or part of your work, be used to cause harm in the hands of the unscrupulous? Now, let's say you're interested in a particular a genetically engineered organism, creating it in the lab for a medical use. Well, an example would be botulinum toxin, Botox, has a number of potential medical uses. But your research, though motivated for medical concerns, could in the hands of the unscrupulous be misused to cause harm. So dual use is considering not just potential harms in the way that you plan on using your research, but how others might use that research. And that includes both the physical product of the research and also what you might publish. So let's sum up. You need to be aware of the organization or organizations that oversee your work, the appropriate risk group for the agents that you're working with, and whether or not you're working with any select agents. You also need to consider any potentials for dual use, and especially any biosafety or biosecurity concerns that are not addressed by the current administrative controls.